You know, the previous talk we talked about soils. Now we're kind of moving up a little bit to talk about plants and the atmosphere. Uh, so moving our way up in, the, uh, in altitude a little bit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so my research looks at forests and how they impact the atmosphere. So I'm a chemist and particularly an atmosphere chemist by training. Uh, and so I look at the chemistry of air pollution and in particular how forests impact that. Uh, and we'll start at the leaf level and then go up to the global scale uh, by the end of the talk. Uh, the research that I'll be presenting today too, part of it was part of my PhD research at Harvard. And then over the past six months, I've started a postdoc at Minnesota. And so you'll see a little bit of preliminary results from that. Uh, but first though, it's always nice to put forests in a global perspective to start such a talk. So as you might remember, maybe from like elementary or middle school, earth science, you know, we're a very watery world. 70% of Earth's surface is covered by water and the other around, you know, 30% is by land. Uh, but you know, terrestrial vegetation, there's a lot of leaves in the world and they contribute a lot of surface area. So here's an image from the uh, NASA MODIS satellite uh, for February of 2000 that essentially looks at that leaf area, uh, surface leaf area, uh, surfa surface area of the leaves across the globe um, for various biomes. And so the darker green represents more leaf area and then you know, brown is less. Um, and when you take into account uh, the surface area from all these leaves, the contribution of that land component, instead of only being, say, 30%, actually increases to around 55% during the summertime and around 40% during January. So leaves, you know, have a particularly significant contribution to the Earth's system. And folks have also been looking at recently, too, whether or not forests are a carbon source or a carbon sink. So this figure is actually taken from a paper published in Nature Climate Change last year, uh, looking at particular forests of the world and seeing whether or not they're a source of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere or a sink. So if it's green, it represents a sink, but there's also areas of the globe that are more purple, particularly in the Amazon, for instance, or the Congo, or Southeast Asia, where we see a source of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere by forests. And this can be due to deforestation or biomass burning, for instance. Um, and so the paper was trying to see, well, is our forests actually, are they becoming a carbon source now instead of a sink? Uh, they did say that over the past two decades that forests are still a net carbon sink, thankfully. Uh, they're estimated to take up about 7.6 billion metric tons of CO2 per year. Uh, so this is a point of comparison. One metric ton of CO2 is about like a 26 foot long cube, which is about the size of that small house there. Um, and the sink strength is about one and a half times larger than what the United States emits annually. Um, so it's quite a large carbon sink still, um, but it is changing over time. And that's something that uh, scientists are looking at to see how this carbon sink is evolving with a uh, warming climate. But one of the things so that I look at, though, as a chemist is the reactive carbon that forests emit. And so there's various types of organic carbon that's emitted that we call biogenic uh, volatile organic carbon, or BVOCs for short, um, of which isoprene is the dominant BVOC, as shown pictured there. Uh, pinene is another molecule that's emitted by forests. Uh, when you go into like a pine forest and you have that nice pine smell, you're breathing in that molecule, uh, alpha pinene there. Um, and th and there's also other molecules too, like beta caryophylline. This is like a 15 carbon atom molecule that trees can emit maybe underneath stressed conditions. Um, and it's volatile enough to go into the gas phase and be reacted away in the atmosphere. And so when you look at this global budget of all these BVOCs, isoprene is the dominant uh, one. It's about half of all emissions, BVOC emissions are isoprene on a global scale. Um, and there's also a slew of other you know, molecules, uh, BVOCs as well being emitted too, of different variety. And it's, it's interesting too that forests actually emit more reactive carbon into the atmosphere than humans do in terms of the VOCs. So this is quite a large significant source of reactive carbon that forests are emitting globally. Um, and even though they're emitting all this carbon, atmospheric concentrations are still in the order of, let's say, parts per billion or parts per trillion. So it's, it's still trace amounts, but it has a large impact on climate and air quality. And so what happens then is when this reactive carbon is emitted into the atmosphere um, from the biosphere, it gets oxidized. You know, Earth's atmosphere is oxidizing, and so you start to add oxygens on to these uh, carbon molecules. 
So again, here's our BVOCs again. And then through photochemical oxidation, either through the OH radical or through ozone, you can get two interesting things that can develop. You can get ozone formation itself, and you can also get secondary organic aerosol. Now, the next question you're asking is like, why should I care about ozone or SOA? And the reason being is that both ozone and SOA have health and climate impacts. So to talk about ozone first, you know, many of you have probably heard of the ozone layer that's in the stratosphere. Um, but, and that's good. You know, and, and ozone in the stratosphere is wonderful because it protects us from harmful UV solar radiation. We want ozone in the stratosphere. Um, in the troposphere where we live, no. <laughs> um, ozone is an air pollutant. At the surface, you do not want to be breathing this in. And in fact, there was a study done in 2010 that estimated that 11 to $18 billion worth of crops are lost annually due to ozone exposure. And what I like about this fact is that it's not just something that, you know, those urban people, they have to deal with ozone. You know, also for rural America, too, and rural parts of the world, um, ozone is a significant, you know, detriment to your crops. And so really, it's something that everyone should be concerned about, air pollution. The other um, thing, SOA, secondary organic aerosol. So aerosols themselves impact the climate and that some aerosols can reflect sunlight back into space and therefore have a cooling impact on the planet. Um, but also, too, SOA has impacts on mortality. So there was a famous study done back in the 90s called the Six Cities Study that looked at six cities across the United States and plotted their fine particle concentrations, that's on the x-axis, and then the mortality rate on the y-axis. And what they saw is that as you increase the fine particles of the aerosols in, let's say, a particular city, the mortality went up. Um, and so this, again, has a health impact as well. We'd rather have low amount of SOA in our cities and various places of work. Um, what I also like about this plot, too, is that the P on there is for Portage, Wisconsin. Um, and I'm from Wisconsin, so you know it's nice to see that there's good air quality there. Um, and so, yes, it kind of makes me a little proud when I see that. But also, too, so again, ozone and SOA, very significant health and climate impacts. But also when these VOCs are oxidized in the atmosphere, they also cause the formation of formaldehyde, um, as shown, which is a common byproduct from this oxidation. And that's the molecule that I've been interested in actually throughout my PhD and now into my postdoc, because formaldehyde, if you can understand its formation processes and can understand how it forms and what, what its sources and sinks are in the atmosphere, it can give you a better understanding, a chemical understanding, of how if we really understand the oxidation chemistry that's going on. Um, so if you understand formaldehyde, you know, it has a good credence that maybe also understanding the oxidation chemistry and the formation of ozone in SOA. And as I said, yeah, formaldehyde is a very ubiquitous oxidation product of VOCs. Indoors, it's usually higher than outdoors because a lot of things emit formaldehyde, like carpets, paints, you know, maybe even your shirt when, it's, when you first buy it. A lot of materials emit formaldehyde, um, and it's considered hazardous air pollutant and even a carcinogen by the EPA, so it's not something you want to be breathing in. Um, you know, if you worked in high school biology, hopefully they've eliminated formaldehyde from uh, preservatives, but I know it's still, <laughs> it still exists. Um, outside in more rural environments, uh, formaldehyde is formed at much lower quantities, um, at, you know, let's say zero to 10 parts per billion. Um, it's not killing you by any means, but uh, it, it does exist, and we can use this now uh, as kind of to understand the oxidation chemistry that's going on. So essentially, using formaldehyde as a tracer, uh, my research has examined the fate of this reactive carbon that's emitted by the biosphere. And there's a wide variety of different approaches that one can take to really look at this. In fact, you can't just do field studies because that would only give you like one piece of the pu puzzle. It's really combining all of these different approaches in order to really get a complete picture of our Earth's system of atmospheric chemistry. So I've done uh, field measurements, lab studies, some modeling, and working with satellites in order to really understand the forest impact on the atmosphere and you know, air pollution, things like that. So first, I'll talk about, I'll give two narratives, just to kind of like nice little summaries of things. The first one is the formaldehyde budget in forest canopies, and this work was done at Harvard. Um, and it included field measurements, lab studies, and modeling to really address this budget question of formaldehyde in a forest. 
And so essentially, you know, I've been on a few field campaigns, and I've been fortunate in my life to travel to places like Antarctica um, and also Michigan, too. So for one summer, uh, <laughs> I lived, I know, <laughs> I lived in a tin shanty, essentially, in this forest in northern Michigan, um, a very interesting kind of environment. I, did not, I didn't realize I was signing up for this when I went to Harvard, actually, but um, I lived, <laughs> I lived in this like campsite for a month and measuring formaldehyde in the forest. And so this site is run by the Univers University of Michigan. Um, it was our group there measuring formaldehyde. Atmospheric chemistry is also very collaborative. So there's many other groups there uh, measuring other molecules like VOCs, ozone, um, SOA. Uh, and what's nice, too, about this site is that it has very minimal anthropogenic influence. So in other words, the prevailing winds from this site usually come from, down from Canada or across from Wisconsin. Um, we're not getting as much interference from the pollution from Chicago or Detroit, for instance. So it's a very pristine environment um, at the, this forest. And essentially, myself and another grad student, there's a tower in the forest, and we sampled formaldehyde at four different heights, as you can see in the schematic here. And for each hour of the day, throughout this month of July, uh, we were just sampling with our instrument formaldehyde at each of these heights. Uh, and I've shown here on a plot just a little bit of that data. And so you can see on the y-axis is the concentration of formaldehyde. And this is reasonable for a forest, you know, zero to, let's say, five or six ppb, or parts per billion. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to in this kind of, in this plot, is the, are the gray shaded regions. Because it's in those gray shaded regions that we saw elevated levels of formaldehyde in the crown space of the canopy, which is the gray part of, the, um, of, of my schematic there. And the question was, is, well, why do we see these elevated levels? What, what's this source of formaldehyde that we're observing here at this site? Uh, this has been observed at other sites in the past as well, and so at other different times. So it's not just like, oh, you just happen to notice it, like just some random fact. But it was, you know, this is kind of a constant thing that we see in the afternoon, these elevated levels of formaldehyde. So the question was, why? And so there's different hypotheses that we had. The first is that maybe there was some unknown oxidation chemistry that we hadn't considered. Um, but, you know, one nice thing, by having all these different measurements at this site, is we're actually able to rule that out because there were other measurements that said, you know, no, it's, unli it's very unlikely that you have some unknown VOC that's producing all of this formaldehyde at a really fast rate to kind of give this signature in the forest. So we said, you know, that's unlikely. The other two are things that we thought, well, maybe this could be a possibility. The first is that there could be a primary emission from the leaf itself or the tree, and folks have observed that formaldehyde can be emitted from leaves. Uh, and the other one is the conversion of a hydroperoxide on the leaf surface, which is something that folks have seen happen in instrumentation before in atmospheric chemistry. And we thought, well, if it can happen on instruments, why can't it happen on a leaf? Uh, and so these two other bullet points here, we can test this in the lab. You know, we can go to the lab after the field study and then actually try to see, uh, is there any primary emission from the tree of formaldehyde or conversion of a hydroperoxide? And so go back to Harvard, and essentially from scratch, we built a plant lab. So we ordered saplings, red oak saplings, cypress saplings. You get one of those fancy LED lights that have like the solar spectrum. Um, bring our instrumentation in you know, to measure formaldehyde, CO2 and water, and a leaf cuvette. So the leaf cuvette, as shown, is just essentially two glass plates that you gently sandwich the leaf in between. And then you can expose it to various levels of formaldehyde, for instance. You can look at the emissions from the leaf. Um, it's a very nice way to, at the leaf level to understand kind of like what's going on and to really control everything. Um, you know, we can control relative humidity, CO2 levels, temperature to really precise levels. And so this helps, you know, give a more con controlled environment as opposed to when you're in, let's say, the forest and there's a lot of moving pieces, you know, a lot of variables changing. Here we can, can try to, con you know, constrain as much as possible these different environmental variables. And I did all this work with Josh Cox, who uh, was also co-first author on this. And so essentially the first question was, uh, do leaves emit formaldehyde? And in order to kind of start answering this question, I need to intro introduce to you one technical term here, which is something called the compensation point. 
And essentially, this is just a concentration at which the concentration of formaldehyde inside the leaf equals the concentration of formaldehyde outside the leaf. And so when they equal, there's no net exchange of formaldehyde. You know, it's, you would see a net flux of zero. And so that, what we, that concentration is what we, we would call the compensation point. So as in the little example, here's a leaf. And so the surface uh, is what we would call the cuticle of the leaf. And then the pores of the leaf, you know, that have the CO2 and water exchange, that's called the stomata, and it can go into the mesophyll. But also other gases can be exchanged through the stomata as well. And so formaldehyde then, if you're above the compensation point, so if there's more formaldehyde in the gas phase surrounding the leaf than inside the leaf, you'll have uptake, and you can either, either have uptake on the cuticle or the surface or through the stomata. Um, if the gas phase concentration of formaldehyde is lower outside the leaf than in the leaf, you would see an emission of formaldehyde from the leaf, as kind of shown here. And essentially, to show the results, so you know, you do this, you can't just test one leaf because this is a biological system, so you do a statistically large sampling of leaves. Um, I think we did like 50 overall during the course of the summer. Um, and each leaf takes a day to do because you have to allow it to equilibrate, you know, make sure it's comfortable, I guess, inside your leaf cuvette, um, co nice and cozy. But essentially, though, we did a wide range of different temperatures and uh, species and oak and cypress trees and different relative humidities. And what we saw is that the magnitude of the compensation point was around one part per billion. You know, so you get this number, and you say, okay, well, I know this compensation point now. The thing, though, is that in a forest, the gas phase concentration of formaldehyde during the day is usually around three to five parts per billion. So you're above the compensation point, which means your leaf won't be emitting formaldehyde. In fact, it'd be taking it up. But then we're seeing an elevated level of formaldehyde in the forest. So that means that whatever source this is has to overcome the fact that the leaves are actually taking up formaldehyde. It's in the wrong direction in some ways. So no. So yes, leaves can technically emit formaldehyde if your gas phase concentration is less than one part per billion, but it wouldn't explain what we saw in the field. So now the next question was, is do we have the conversion of a hydroperoxide on the leaf? So don't worry, I do have a picture of what this looks like. Uh, because I realize this is very uh, chemical thing here. Um, so this molecule here, isoprene hydroxyhydroperoxide, or for short, we just call it 1,2-isopru for this particular isomer, um, I know, is a first generation oxidation product of isoprene in pristine conditions. So, uh, you know, you would not have this molecule really forming in an urban environment because the chemistry was just in a different chemical regime in a, in a city. But in a forest, though, where you have low, what we'd say low NOx, or just low amounts of anthropogenic pollution, um, this molecule is actually being formed in the gas phase. Um, and like formaldehyde, it can be taken up either via the surface of the leaf or through the stomata. And the question was, well, can this convert then to form formaldehyde and another molecule called methyl vinyl ketone? Um, another group saw that it can form methyl vinyl ketone um, back in 2020. And then we said, well, maybe it also is, could also be a contribution to formaldehyde as well. Um, and so that's what we set out to do. And again, too, this work, all of this work was actually prefaced back in 2016 when they saw that isopu was converting inside instruments to form formaldehyde and MVK, and it was kind of messing up everyone's atmospheric measurements. Um, and so, you know, the, again, the hypothesis is, you know, does this form formaldehyde when it lands on the leaf? And what we see, so we did multiple yield experiments um, for these oak and cypress leaves at, two, at 30 degrees Celsius and 40% RH. And what we actually see is that there's quite significant leaf-to-leaf -leaf variability. So the yield, again, is on the y-axis, and then the oak and cypress, these are the two trees that we did our experiments on. So quite a wide range. The air bars are quite large, as you might expect from such a measurement. It's, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces here. Um, but essentially, though, what we saw is at least the weighted means of both of these sets you know, were above 50%. And so this was, um, you know, this could be, you know, a dominant source of formaldehyde into the forest canopy. You know, it's in the right part of the canopy, there's isopu in this pristine forest, and so this could be a possible, you know, answer to why, what we were observing in the field. But in order to really address that question, though, you have to then model the forest. Um, so we have, we have our field measurements now that we took at this Michigan site. We have these laboratory results 
that now we have in hand and have parameterized. So now we have to put this into a model to see if we can actually simulate what we observed in the field. And so essentially, um, the model that I use, uh, one of the models that I use is a forest canopy model that was developed at the University of Michigan. And essentially, it models the forest by a set of stacked boxes, one on top of the other. And it models then the chemistry that goes on in, inside each of those boxes, transport, emissions of gases, deposition of gases, in order to really simulate the chemical environment that we observed. Um, and so this is the model that was used. And again, so I initialized the model for a particular day in the forest when things were photochemically active. And what we see then so I'll, are these two heat maps. So on the left here, essentially, is what is if you run the model without our laboratory results. So again, on the y-axis is the height of the forest canopy. Uh, the x-axis shows the time of day. And the black boxes are the crown space. So this is the height in which the leaves are located in your forest canopy. And so on the left here, you can see that there's, as you go down, let's say from, oops, no, not that. As you go down from top to bottom, you don't really see any gradient of formaldehyde being simulated. Now that's just the model before we include any of our laboratory results. On the right is what you see when you introduce our laboratory results into the model. And so as you go down from 35 down to zero, you can actually see during the afternoon hours of the, of the day, you actually see a slight gradient form inside the forest. Um, and this is due to the introduction of our laboratory results into the model there. Uh, and in fact, this is quite novel because no one's really ever included in a canopy model the conversion of, let's say, one reactive species into another because of surface chemistry going on. Uh, and so that was something that was a novel part of this work here. Uh, but essentially, it wasn't the compensation point that was driving this elevated level. In fact, it was the conversion of that isopu molecule um, that was helping to partially account for the elevated levels of formaldehyde in the crown space on that particular day. And one nice thing with atmospheric chemistry is now this motivates future studies. Now people will go back out to the field, see if they can observe this in other environments, and then you can kind of continue to simulate those environments then, and that kind of iteratively improves our understanding of the chemistry of the atmosphere. Okay, so that was my work at Harvard. Um, but then six months ago, uh, I moved to the University of Minnesota to start a postdoc. And there now, I've kind of moved from the leaf level and the canopy level now to a global level by looking at satellite isoprene. And so this uh, work now uses satellites and global modeling to understand really atmospheric chemistry on a global scale. So there's various hot spots of isoprene around the globe. Um, and this satellite product that was recently developed by folks at the University of Minnesota and JPL is really the first of its kind because it gives an unprecedented tool to study isoprene um, directly across multiple years in different ecosystems. You know, before two years ago, such a picture like this plot, um, it took a lot of work to kind of estimate isoprene emissions based on other measurements and other satellite measurements. But this is actually a direct, a direct isoprene measurement now that we can use in order to really look at hotspots around the globe. Um, and so the two sites, this is for January of averaged between 2013 to 2020. And you can see there's hot spots, at least in January, over the Amazon, the Congo, in Africa, um, Southeast Asia, Australia. Because it's January, there's no emission in North America because there's no leaves on the trees. Um, but we'll actually look at two of these um, regions. Uh, the first are the Ozarks uh, in Missouri. And then we'll also look at the Congo. And th again, this is all new, uh, fresh data that we're st just starting to look at. So first are the Ozarks. Uh, so you can see here from 2012, a record of isoprene column from 2012 to 20. Uh, 20. Um, in black is the satellite measurement, so that's from the CRIS instrument, um, and that's on board the satellite itself. And then in red is the geoschem modeled um, 
quantity, which is uh, essentially a large chemical transport model that we use to understand atmospheric chemistry. And you can see relatively good agreement between Geos, Chem, and Chris over this period of time. Uh, also, too, we see in 2012 was a drought year in the Ozarks, and both the model and the satellite see elevated levels of isoprene during that year. Um, at least compared, elevated in magnitude compared to other years. So it's cool that we can see these climatological impacts in the record. And the other side I just wanted to point out was the Congo. Um, so in fact, the previous slide, as you can see, there's a peak in the summer and then a minima during the winter, which corresponds to, you know, leaves in the summer and no leaves during the winter. Um, in the Congo rainforest in Africa, you get two peaks per year. And that actually is, corresponds to the similar two peaks in just leaf area, surface area of leaves, um, that's also present. There's a cycle of that observed in the Congo rainforest. Um, and then in terms of model measurement comparison, we see that the model underpredicts what we're actually observing. And so again, this just suggests that the model is currently missing some isoprene emission source that now should be added into the model in order to improve simulations in the future. Um, so that's what this helps us to do, it allows us to kind of then see where is the model performing well and like, you know, you improve accordingly um, from there. So again, as just to conclude here, again, my, my work, we look at the fate of reactive carbon from the biosphere and what happens to it in the atmosphere. And the goal, the overall goal is to have a better understanding of the atmospheric chemistry that then influences air quality and then climate change and human health. So that's a really big overall picture of the work that we do. And so again, I just want to acknowledge my colleagues, both at Harvard and at Minnesota, uh, NASA and, NASA and Mis Michigan. Um, as well, feel free to always contact me. My email address is on the screen and also a Twitter handle. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.